So my topic is identity as a barrier for growth. Now that might seem a little contradictory up here. How many of you believe that the world's changing dramatically right now? Show of hands? Okay, good, I don't have to convince you of that then. <laughs> That's what I study at the Center for the Edge every day. I lead research there, and we look at how the world's changing, what are the deep underlying shifts that are causing the change, and how it manifests, like how does it influence us as individuals and institutions? So that's what I study day to day. And so there's a macro part of how it you know, breaks down business and changes the world we live in, but there's also a the micro part. What does it do to the way we behave, the way we interact, the way we connect with people, and therefore identity is a key part of that? And what I'd like to argue in the next 15 minutes, the traditional ways that we think about identity, those ways that we look at identity, it's a barrier to our growth at two levels, as individuals and at a meta-social level as well. So let me start with myself. So this is me in a set of pictures as a kid growing up, family, wife, work, college, my work profile, all that stuff. But well, what's wrong with this image? What identity does society bestow upon me? Well my race, my color, my education, my experience, they're all very static. They don't, and, and static might be okay, except we all agree the world's changing. So in a dynamic world, and I'll get a little bit more about the dynamic world, in a dynamic world, a static identity, these things that just people see of you, it's a prism. So let's talk about the dynamic world. We are living in incredible times. We are living in times kind of when electricity was introduced, except a lot more amplified. The, the internet, the digital infrastructure is changing everything we know around us. Every year we put out this, uh, we have a study called the Shift Index, um, and we study about 25 metrics, we track them over the long period of time, and this is kind of our money slide. It, it's looking at all public companies in the US over a period of 45 years since the advent of the microprocessor, the, the beginning of this digital infrastructure, and return on assets, essentially firm performance, has declined 75%. And you see a little ups and downs here, but it's a very steady decline. And we have uh, many metrics talking about competitive intensity, the topple rate, all of those things are saying the same thing. We're under increasing pressure and it's not gonna stop, it's gonna keep going on. But here's a paradox, there's a performance paradox here. At that same time period, labor productivity has gone up. So we're working harder and harder to achieve less. So when you talk about this to executives, they often bring up the idea of the Red Queen from Alice in Wonderland, you know, you're running faster and faster to stay in the same place. I would actually argue that the Red Queen had it good because we're running, we're working hard and harder to fall behind. And this isn't limited to institutions. We all feel it. We're all working hard and harder. And I'm not sure that any of us would say that we are achieving that much more for all the work we do. But, but there's a flip side to this that we don't see. The same digital infrastructure, the same things that are causing all the disruptions that we see here, that we see in this graph, that, that causes all that pressure, there's a flip side. Along with increased pressure comes increased opportunity. We can do so much more now than we could ever before. Three examples that'll make this come to life. Kiva, everyone knows of Kiva. But look at those numbers. Over a million people around the world got money from 700,000 other people that they didn't know to the tune of $275 million. Now, it's not like networks of lending didn't exist before. They've always existed. But it's the magnitude and the speed of that. That's what's incredible. Arab Spring in the last year. Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, Bahrain, Syria, Yemen. There's actually more countries. These are the ones most impacted. Again, it's not that revolutions haven't happened in the past. It's a magnitude and the speed of that. That's incredible. The third one is a bit of an esoteric example. There's a, a set of researchers at the University of Washington put together a game to solve tough scientific problems. And they were collating tens of thousands of people with little or no scientific background to just play a game to solve these things. And they... Uh, there's an HIV uh, protein that they're trying to craft that had been stumping the scientific community for 10 years, and the gamers did it in three weeks. It was incredible. And that's just, all of these are just, the, it's a tip of the iceberg. 
It's a tip of the iceberg if you look, for example, if the, it's a tip of the iceberg of what we're going to be able to achieve. So I believe that we're living in times we can solve anything as humankind. We can get together and do anything. But what does it require? It requires us to get together and build relationships in a meaningful way to work together. And every time we talk about numbers and scaling, people think, oh, it's a numbers game. How many friends do you have on Facebook or LinkedIn and all that? And it's not. It's not that at all. It's not about numbers. It's about scaling trust. It's about building relationships and scaling trust. When you unpack that state, statement of scaling trust, there's three levels to it. Building trust is hard enough on its own, and now we're talking about scaling trust, not just building trust. And now we're talking about scaling trust in a dynamic world, in a world that's changing, where everything around us is changing. It's not an easy problem to solve. And that's where I believe that the way we do things has to change. So let, let's talk about how do we consider trust today. We've become a world of this to some extent. You know, as a good corporate citizen, one of the things that they taught me early on and kept beating into me was, you got to craft your personal brand. And I hated it. And crafting the personal brand and the way they taught it to you was like, show all your strengths and capabilities and hide all your weaknesses. I thought that was bad advice in a static world. I think it's horrible advice in a dynamic world. But it works, right? Why did people give that advice? It's because of stereotypes. I mean, stereotypes are neural shortcuts so that the brain doesn't have to work too hard. You see something, it looks like it. So when you see an expert, you expect it to be an expert. It, it's like a doctor smock. You know, that's why all the advertisements you know, have the, the person, the dentist or the doctor. So I'm like, but we don't believe that anymore. The more and more manicured the world has become, the more and more it looks like this, we don't trust something that looks as pristine. So this gets a little bit into the discussion of trust, instrumental trust and personal trust. Instrumental trust is trust that's bestowed upon you based on activity you have performed. So it's, it's attached to a skill set. So it's inherently backward looking. Personal trust, in contrast, is attached to your character. So it's more adaptable. When you think of a changing world, it's forward predicting. And that's what we need. So we need to yearn for authenticity in identity. Two things, and there's a lot of things that go into authenticity, but two things I'd like to focus on. Passion and vulnerability. So passion, it's not the romantic type of passion that I'm talking about here. It, it, it's about the strong emotions that motivate you to go beyond your comfort zone, to achieve the, the potential that resides within you. Passion internally, it, it comes from inside. It's not imposed or mandated from the outside. And because it comes from inside, it gives you direction, it gives you focus, it gives you orientation. Now, passionate people, they don't have too much patience or pretense. They expose themselves as they are because they, they intuitively understand that that's the best way they can explore and learn. And because of that, they have a distinct personal identity. And that identity comes from creating something and from others building upon that creation. So it's not an identity based on consumption. It's an identity based on shared creation. So to the second aspect of authenticity and identity, it's vulnerability. And vulnerability is it's inherently hard. It's very hard to expose yourself to risk. Risk of rejection. Risk that someone will take that information and use it against you. But vulnerability allows you to build relationships very quickly. It's a very strong tool. So passion and vulnerability might be oddly juxtaposed because you think that if you're passionate, you're an expert at something, why would you want to reveal your weaknesses? And in times of increasing pressure, you see this more and more. People, they hadn't done the bachelor's and they're like, no, I'm just going like, to talk about my capabilities and not expose what I don't know. So it's ironic that our training goes against exactly what we need today. But Maybe a, a story will bring this life. Chris Anderson, the editor of Wired magazine, he had a personal passion. He has a passion for unmanned aircraft, for drones. So he, he's been doing it as a hobby for a while, and at one point he decided he wants to go start a company for this. So he wanted to go look for a CTO, a technical partner, to run this company with him. So he went to all the places you'd think about. He went to Stanford, MIT, 
talked to other PhD students, just couldn't find the right person. But there was this one person on the online community that is participant who could answer all his questions. So at one point he said, hey, you know, where do you get your PhD from? And didn't get an answer. So he investigated a little bit and found out after a while that Jordi Munoz, the guy who was answering all his questions, was essentially a high school dropout from Tijuana, Mexico. And Chris did start his company, and Jordi is now his CTO. So it's incredible when you have a passion, you live it out, and you expose that, even though Chris was an expert in this topic, that he was asking questions, and that's how serendipity strikes. When you live authentically, things start happening. I started with myself as a static identity. What about myself in this context? What am I doing here? I came to college, I got out, ended up in consulting one way or the other. Wasn't really my plan. Did that for a few years. I was a good trooper, applied to business school, got into business school. And then I paused and said, wow, I'm entering the world of manicured personalities. Everyone's going to be in like blue shirts and khaki pants. So what did I do? I decided to go blonde. That's a big risk because I didn't know and I was going into a new environment. I didn't know anyone there. And there I am turning up blonde. I look like a freak. Everyone treated me like a freak. But that wasn't bad. Blondes do have more fun. I can attest to that. <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing. I just had an intuition that I had to do something. It was based out of intuition. It was based out of a rebellion to what existed. And then, so I kept it up. I only picked one picture from my college, and there were many that were much worse. I had many different colors. I had pink, green. It, it, I got reinforcement from the environment that made me keep doing it for the next two years. And then I continued it. We're coming back to Deloitte, I put some normal pictures in there, but here's me with a 70s porn star look. Um, not too long ago, and this was my mullet, and that was a month ago when I went from like a mop of hair to being bald for no reason, and this is now. Um, I didn't have words for what I did, but I learned recently, you know, when thinking about it, it was a form of play. It was a form of play where you expose yourself where you get people beyond their comfort zones and you engage them at an authentic level. It lowers the threshold for embarrassment. You can't look much worse than this. I, I don't really look good in any of these things. <laughs> but it engages people at an authentic level and it, it brings a different conversation. And I, didn't, I did this out of gut and I didn't know what I was doing. By the way, my mom hates this. I'm, I'm 38 and she's wondering when I'm going to stop this nonsense. I'm going home for the summer and she told me to for once, I look like a normal person. But all this story, I mean, I, I, I'm not, if you notice, I'm not talking about passion here. And that's because I haven't found my passion yet. And it frustrates me that I haven't. I am jealous of people like Bill and others who have, and Luke, who have found their passions. And I'm, I'm, I'm yearning for it. I'm continuing this journey of trying to figure out what it is that I really care about and how do I go about it. But I talk to people. And looking strange helps you because people don't talk to you as well. Uh, I talk to people and try to figure out what their passions are and if that triggers anything about my passions. I, uh, I try to listen to my intuition. Now you think from my hair and everything, yes, now that was done with intuition, but I'm trained as an engineer and a consultant. I take pride in thinking logically. Listening to your intuition isn't easy. It doesn't come easily for me. I try things, old and new. I pick up hobbies that I had before and see if that's something I want to like, make my passion or is it, or try new things and see if there's something else. So it's a journey that continues. And that's how I strive to live with an identity that's authentic. But I talked about a lot of things, so uh, let me try and pull it all together with this one last slide. We're living in dramatic times, the world's changing dramatically. We have the opportunity to solve big problems that we couldn't have even a decade ago. But in order to do that, we had to create new models of scaling trust in a dynamic world. And that requires us to shift from instrumental trust to personal trust and to authenticity in identity. And authenticity in identity hinges on passion and vulnerability. So let me pose a few questions for you. Have you figured out your passion? I mean, have you figured out what makes you tick? When's the last time you took a risk with identity? When's the last time you exposed a vulnerability? 
Too many of us go through life as zombies. Take a risk. Do something that makes you uncomfortable, that makes you challenge your stereotypes. Play. And try for authenticity in your identity. Try for authenticity in your relationships. Good things will happen, and together we can change the world.